I still on my screen and I just restarted? All I see is a blue circle with a B saying that you're presenting. Okay, in that case, there's there's something on your end that's not uh, accepting my uh, presentation. So I'll tell you what I can do. Um, if everyone will bear with me, I'm going to shut down and restart. So I hopefully don't have this problem again. So take about five minutes. There's time to go and uh, get another cup of coffee or check on that noise in the other room while I go through this restart problem and we'll start up again. So I'll be back in a moment. Do you want me to shut my computer down and bring it back up? I would say you should do that, yes. Okay. All right, hello. <clears throat> I've signed back on. And it gave me a message that this meeting was being recorded already. So I'm going to look for presentation evidence. And it says I am presenting. And it says I am recording. 
So I'm going to go to chat first thing and um, give me some messages because the, when I restarted, I lost all your chat sign-ins before. Would you tell me if you can see and hear my presentation? Ryan says, all is good. Amber says it's good. Who else can hear me? Jessica, hello, Amber. I'm getting go. Chloe says, okay. So uh, go ahead. If you have not signed in, please be sure and sign in. And it says I'm recording this session. So this will be a very strange introduction to one of my recorded lectures. But since I'm recording and presenting, and apparently successfully. I'm going to go to entire screen and the slide we began with just a moment ago. And that's the tissue level of organization. In brief, tissues are made of specialized cells that have a distinct function. Multiple tissues have to group together to make an organ. Almost the, all the organs have all four tissue types. And there's a very strong relation in this lecture with the tissue lab. It's held together by specific molecular structures. So if you think of the ways we join things when we're doing arts or construction, we glue things, we rivet things, we make buttons, we have rivets with holes in the middle, so they're perforated. Um, we stitch things together with needle and thread. All of these cell junctions resemble one or one of those methods uh, uh, or another. So we're going to take a look at these cell junctions first. Here are two cells with their villi at the top. Now villi are protrusions shown here, little projections. The purpose of this finger-like projection is to increase the surface area because it's a passive membrane, it probably means this is important for absorption or molecular exchange, or it may be important for membrane enzyme systems. Over here, we have a very different kind of extension. These wave back and forth burning ATP. On a single-celled organism, that means it scoots it through the water. On a multicellular organism like us, it only occurs on the inner surfaces and on those inner surfaces, it is going to be waving back and forth to move material along the surface of the cell. Other than that, it's a pretty regular cell with a nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, and here are a couple of cell junctions. This is showing a single or simple epithelium, one columnar cell on top of connective tissue. This would be called the basement membrane. So we can see here we're having to attach in this location membrane to membrane. Down here we're having to connect membrane to some kind of basement material that's different. So the different structures that make up the cell junctions are going to have to adapt to the different materials that they are connecting. Here's a more, uh, I think, representative diagram. And the things I want you to mention, I want you to notice, are right here. Here's the basement membrane again. This is the free surface. So these are the top of villi. And notice that these villi are constructed with fibers that run up like poles, and the membrane then drapes around them. The cell junctions that are shown are right here at the polar end. The free end doesn't have support from another cell up at this level. So it has to be bound together tightly. And so this region is what we call a tight junction, a very, very strong membrane joining that will also prevent any absorption or molecular exchange so tight. The open part of the cell or the surface part of the cell doesn't just hold open by accident. It is held open by this fibrous mat. This is sort of like a scotch bite pad a mat of fibers, very strong, that attach to the membrane all the way around and provide support. This is called the terminal web, a part of the cytoskeleton. Here we have membrane to membrane connections that are more like rivets, called spot desmosomes. Here we have membrane to membrane that are different. The middle part of these connections have a hole. 
So if you have a gap junction here, the cytoplasm on this side and the cytoplasm on this side are actually flowing through those holes. Down at the bottom, what looks like a spot desmosome on the bottom is what we call a hemidesmosome. It's the same structure on the membrane side, but down below you're connecting to connective tissue, which is very different. You can kind of see its profile here. Let's take a closer look at these. Here is the tight junction. You can see the membrane kind of billowing out between the connection points. And these are proteins that perforate the membrane and each protein, like a little spot or like a little stitch, holds on to that part of the membrane. And then the proteins on the different membranes, the two sides, lock together here to produce a very tight junction for this end, this polar end of the cell. What we have is, uh, to me, very reminiscent of stitching with the repetition of these uh, uh, polar, I'm sorry, these uh, protein that are interlocking junctional proteins. They really look like very fine stitching. Down below where the terminal web occurs, there is a protein band shown here in purple. And you can see from the red dots, the, the fibers of the terminal web the supporting cytoskeleton actually penetrate into this band, sort of like one of those tape bands you use in sewing to reinforce the connection of pieces of cloth or edges. But a special feature of this adhesion belt created by that band are these alternating proteins from side to side. Notice how the post of the protein extends down and joins to the adhesion belt. And the paddles, which are uh, basically sticking between the membranes, attract one another to hold the cells together very tightly at this point. Tight junctions prevent the diffusion of fluids and solutes between the cells above, and the adhesion belt lies below those tight junctions. And the belt is tied to the terminal web. So this is really a lot of uh, stickiness and a lot of support. Here is a gap junction. It, as you can see, penetrates this gel membrane and it has a series, a, a circle of embedded protons called connexons. Quite inventive these names, but you can see from the cross section here that like the other connectors, they go halfway and then they bind together. So between the membrane, there's a binding. And this is sort of acting like a little rivet or a button on each end. It's this expanded lip that is actually uh, basically distributing the force over more area so it doesn't tear through that flimsy membrane. The feature of the gap junction that's most important, though, is this hole. That means the cytoplasm over here can actually flow through a hole to contact the cytoplasm over here. Imagine this left cell makes a secretion. It would spontaneously diffuse into the adjacent cell without needing to go across the membrane. Um, imagine that it, instead of a uh, secretion, there's some kind of chemical influence in this cell. It could diffuse across it uh, as well. So small ions and molecules can diffuse between the two cells. This is a desmosome, a structure for tying elements of the cytoskeleton. That's these uh, more dispersed or radiating fibers. These are parts of the cytoskeleton that will attach to these uh, plates, these purple plates, like the heads of a rivet is what they look like to me. But they provide a way that the cytoskeleton can attach to the membrane and basically create spacing or hold the uh, internal part of the cell uh, uh, apart. Like uh, before, we see these, uh, like in the tight junction, uh, gap, uh, I'm sorry, the adhesion belt, you see these cell adhesion molecules, which are proteins. One end extends into the base plate on the outside of the membrane. And because it's large and pressing over a large surface or a large spot of the membrane, it provi provides a little more force of adhesion. Here between the membranes, these cell adhesion molecules attract one another. 
and they basically provide a sticky zone that holds these two membranes together. This is called a spot desmosome when you have this structure on both sides of the membrane. However, when you have it at the base, there's no membrane below. So here's that base plate and cytoskeleton. But in this case, there are new fibers that penetrate from below the membrane, the base plate, and wrap around the elements of the cytoskeleton. Down below, these same fibers will wrap around the connective tissues matrix. These are probably meant to be fibers of the base layer. Perhaps this is an areolar tissue, a loose connective tissue. Areolar tissue often lies at the basement position, providing a clean adhesive surface that uh, whole cells can uh, attach to. Now, as I said before, four tissues, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nerves, and each with a set of specialized functions. How do we characterize them in words, and how would we recognize them in a figure or in a microscope? The big characteristic of epithelial tissue when it, is, when it is mature is it forms surfaces. Now that's both inside and out. It does form the surface of our skin and hair and nails which grow out and are shown outside in association are accessory structures of that, of that integumentary system. However, inside the body, every organ has its surfaces. The heart has an outer surface. The heart has chambers which pump the blood. Those are inner surfaces and they are aligned with epithelial tissue. Always epithelial tissue will face a space. So that means if you have a section you're looking through the microscope where the cells end and the space begins is epithelial tissue. It might be a very small, thin, cell and only one cell thick or uh, in other places those linings can be multiple cells with different shapes. Another feature of epithelial tissue very important all glands of the body arise from epithelial tissue. Now when we're talking about oil glands or sweat glands that are actually in the skin that actually makes great sense. But what about a, uh, a gland like the um, adrenal gland, which sits on top of the kidney, deep inside the abdominal cavity, inside many membranes, with no apparent connection at maturity to the epithelial tissues or the epidermis. Well, it turns out that if you study the development and the differentiation of the uh, adrenal gland, the important feature is that epithelial tissue gives rise to the start of its development. So it is some epithelial tissue that generates the beginning of differentiation that's making that gland. Now, as the body grows, other cells and layers surround it, and the connection to the epithelium um, uh, atrophies away. So it's not apparent when we look at a mature body. But all of our research indicates that epithelial tissue is the cell type that can produce secretions. Epithelial tissue is going to be de de described by a formula, by the shape and by the number of cell layers. Here is what is called uh, epithelial tissue. You can see here simple tissue because there's only one cell layer. When they draw it this way, this pink base here is the basement membrane. That's connective tissue typically areolar tissue. And here above, where there is just a white space, that is the space, the opening. This is forming a surface. And you notice we have simple squamous. These are flat like a pancake with very tight uh, sealing between the membranes of the adjacent cells, but very, very thin. Squamous is really good when you're doing absorption because uh, there are only two membranes and a small amount of cytoplasm to get across. 
if the cell is more equally dimensional, the width and the height are about the same, we call it cuboidal. And again, simple because there's one cell layer. Finally, over here, if the dominant, the largest dimension is length, is height, what we see here is what's called simple columnar epithelium, one layer, column-shaped cells. In this case, they've elaborated the uh, space-facing surface with villa. If there are more than one layer of cells, it is called stratified. So we have here stratified squamous. And the first time I looked at this, I had a question. I said, well, look up here at the surface, they're flat and they're pancake shaped. In, in some cases, the nucleus is missing. These are probably dead cells then. But how are down here at the base, at the basement membrane, they're more cuboidal. How do I name this? The convention for naming is you take the cell that faces the surface, that faces the space. Because these upper cells are pancake shaped, they are, this is stratified squamous epithelium. Over here, we see two layers or more of cells and more of a cuboidal shape, so stratified cuboidal. In this case, we see that transition from cuboidal at the base, but growing in height until it reaches this outer layer. This is in a column shape using the convention of what faces the space. These are columnar cells, stratified columnar. Now you can tell, you can apply this formula just by looking. And that leads us to the wide variety of cell types we see on surfaces throughout the body. Now these are sometimes outer surfaces, sometimes inner linings. And we'll begin with the lining of the ventral body cavity. In this case, it looks like they're taking it from a membrane called the omentum. And when we look down on it, we see very flat, thin cells, squamous, and only a single layer. So basically, this is simple squamous epithelium. Here's an actual micrograph showing you the nuclei in their well-spaced array as they basically uh, are magnified by the microscope. The uh, outer surfaces, and especially those surfaces that are exposed to mechanical stress or to uh, chemical features, um, will have multiple layers. This is a great example of the stratified squamous epithelium from the surface of the tongue. Stratified squamous in many layers because the tongue surface is handling the most um, abrasive material we put in our body regularly, and that's our solid food. So our tongue is responsible for moving that food around, for positioning it so that it is thoroughly chewed, and then moving it back into position to swallow. As a result, we're constantly growing new layers, and that eating activity with the solid abrasion is scraping cells off of you. Now, I want you to look at the micrograph. What's really clear from this square figure, here's the space right here. Notice how flattened these cells are. These are the very surface cells, the superficial squamous. As we cut down, we can see they become more and more cuboidal in appearance. The most apparent uh, organelle, the nucleus, is evident in all the cells at the base. Now we are basically dividing these cells from this basal layer. And as new cells appear down where the pointer is now, they basically, basically push in under the older cells and push them toward the surface. So we're growing from the basement membrane toward the free surface all the time. Now, I want you to notice something about this epithelial layer because it there's a clear junction with a very, very different layer below it. This layer is connective tissue. And the characteristic you look for in connective tissue is scattered cells with a non-living matrix. So these darker spots that are spaced out, those are the nuclei of the living cells of the connective tissue. And between them, that light pink, kind of uh, lined structure. That's a non-living matrix tissue, in this case a fiber, most likely collagen. 
So what you see between that clear junction right there where the vision, the visual image shifts is epithelium above and connective tissue below. We'll see this clue again when we look at more connective tissues. Here is a great example of epithelial tissue in the very, very fine structures, a microscopic structure shown right where the pointer is called the nephron is responsible for making urine in the kidneys. It's a tiny, tiny tube, and there are literally millions in the kidney to increase the surface area for this very difficult chemical job. But inside the tiniest tubes are enclosed to carry the processed urine from place to place, and you'll notice when we cut across them, here is a single layer of cells that forms the entire circuit around that space. In this case, this is simple cuboidal epithelium, and the single cell forms both the outer surface and the inner surface. The surrounding connective tissue, notice the pink appearance and the scattered nuclei, and inside the hole that runs through the tube. Now, a general term for an opening is a lumen, so that is the lumen of the nephron tube. We can see these cuboidal cells maintaining the integrity of these tiny tubes. They may be small, but they must be tight to hold the processed urine as it's being made and flown, flowing around. And then here is a basement membrane type structure. Now over here, you, this, this drawing really helps us interpret this. What we've done is cut into a tube. Here's the lumen shown as a white space. And here's the simple cuboidal epithelium forming one tube. But right next to it, as we see in the kidney, is a part of a, a, the next nephron. So it kind of looks like solid tissue. There is connective tissue between it, but this section doesn't show it well. So from simple cuboidal, we go to models of glandular secretion. Because we said epithelial tissue gives rise to all our glands. We're going to look at the different ways that cells make their secretion and store it and the different ways they release it. And there are three ways. They are named the merocrine. If you're making it and packaging it in vesicles and those vesicles are releasing it into the space. The apocrine if you're actually taking a short cell and growing it, and as you grow it, you're making the secretion and those vesicles are accumulating in the top half. When the cell is full, you see this pinching in like cytokinesis? It basically pinches it off and breaks off the top half of the cell. And the cell debris of this portion, the membrane and the cytoplasm and organelles go along with the vesicles and the secretion that is released. We see apocrine secretion here in the mammary gland. And finally, in this stratified picture at the lower part, we're looking at a sebaceous gland where this lower level is where cell division uh, begins. But as those new cells are produced here, they basically push the older cells up. And as the cells migrate from basement to the polar surface, they make more and more secretion. When they reach the surface, the membrane ruptures and all of the cell contents are released, certainly the vesicles with their secretion, but also the nucleus, the organelles, the cytoplasm, and the membrane are all destroyed and distributed in this sebaceous release. So let's take a look one by one. The first example, the salivary gland, you can see that using gene expression, we're probably making a protein. The endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, as we outlined before, is making vesicles. By exocytosis, they are expelling those. This is called merocrine secretion, and this is the way our salivary glands behave. Apocrine secretion, as found in the uh, mammary glands in the female uh, at the time of um, at the time of uh, gestation and birth, uh, the body begins to make milk from these short cells. They basically grow back toward a 
columnar shape, making the milk uh, and, and securing it in vesicles until we have these fully mature cells on either side, and they pinch off the upper top and break them down, releasing not only the milk, but all the cell debris and uh, uh, the nourishment from the monomers that make up uh, the cell components. This is called apocrine secretion, and it involves the loss of the top half of the cell. In the sebaceous gland, we have uh, uh, holocrine secretion with the cell growing up and basically making large amounts of oil and securing it in the surface area until the cell reaches the upper level, in this case about the fourth level up, and basically ruptures and is replaced by cells pushing up from below. This is called holocrine secretion. So that's enough for the introduction to epithelial tissue. What about connective tissue? The recognition of connective tissue is scattered cells with non-living matrix. That matrix may be a crystal that's as hard as rock, like forms the structure of our bones. It may be a gel-like material that varies in its uh, density and structure. So for example, we have two facial structures, our ears and the outer portion of our nose that are maintained in its shape and size by internal cartilage. Um, it may be fibers, fibers like collagen, elastic fiber, reticular fiber, or other structures. These particular matrix material uh, kind of tell the story for the function of connective tissue. The name tells it all. It's going to connect together different cells, assemble them into organs, organ systems, and uh, the body and its typical anatomy. This non-living matrix is often characteristic to show you a sort of an imaginary but very rich connective tissue. We see scattered cells. In this picture, what you're seeing are a variety of cells. Many of them have nuclei. Here is an adipose cell and its nucleus and a second one. This is a mesenchyme cell, which is an embryonic cell. Here's a macrophage, a lymphatic cell, a mast cell for healing reactions, and a, another macrophage. Here's a fibroblast. This is a cell that would make the non-living matrix shown. This kind of striped, thick structure is a collagen fiber, our strongest fiber, and the one that actually stretches the least. But we can see two other kinds of strands. Here is a blue branching fiber that is elastic. You, it actually stretches and rebounds. Elastic fibers. And here is a sequence of finer fibers that are arranged in a net-like or reticular configuration. The fibers shown here are the non-living matrix. In a microscope slide, this pink background might well be a cartilage background, which sort of appears just like an empty, washed out colored area in most slides. Um, or it could be uh, a clear liquid like the plasma of the blood. There are many connective tissues and we need them all. Here is a micrograph. These black sequences are the are the individual cells. I think this is probably stained with con Congo black, which stains every cell. But do you notice how they're scattered out? There's all this space between them. And between the space, you'll have the ground substance. It may be liquid. It may be a gel-like material. And you can see the presence of at least two kinds of fibers. This red fiber running in very different directions is providing support so the tissue does not pull apart based on its the stress that's applied to it. And over here, this thinner fiber is an elastic fiber. Elastic fiber. Let's look at several. Some of these are so characteristic that characteristic. Once you look at them in the microscope, you'll never forget them. Others are a little more difficult. 
take more analysis. So adipose tissue is a connective tissue. Now we think about fat as energy storage, and it is, but it's also good as a loose connective tissue. Pack it into spaces so things can move. They can basically move against those cushiony fat cells, but they can't move out of place. They can't tangle around each other. So sort of like a combination of uh, energy storage and styrofoam peanuts. Now, this diagram is not really clear what's happening. The cells look so large and they look so clear. But in one of these cells in the book, if you can see this nucleus right below the pointer, there's just a little strand of pink running up that membrane. That's the entire cytoplasm of the cell. The central clear portion is a vacuole that contains oil. Now, what's the difference between fat and oil? They're both lipids. And the energy storage is being done in, in fat uh, by an oil deposit. But the difference is what it's like at room temperature. Oil is usually liquid, and it's usually a free liquid. Fat is cells that are filled with oil, but because they're enclosed in cells, they're solid at room temperature. What happens when you take fat from an animal tissue and put it in a hot skillet, you start disrupting those cells and the oil runs out is what we call grease. So that's what we're looking at here, our first connective tissue, fat. Functions are padding and cushioning um, we see this in places where there are spaces, and this is a problem in the body. We kind of mentioned this with membranes, but it's repeated again and again. When you have different parts working closely together and there's movement, there's a good chance that they'll rub against each other with high friction. There's a good chance that they'll wrap around or foul each other and break. Fat as packing is really good. Fat is also wonderful insulator, so fat layers help in heat retention or temperature uh, retention or insulation. And uh, they also act as our long-term energy storage. Reticular tissue has a lot of reticular fibers and they're net-like. And you know a rope is kind of interesting. It's flexible. You can't push on a rope and get anything done. But if you pull it, it comes tight. And along that plane of force, it supports and prevents further movement. So what happens when you have a net-like network of fibers pointing in all directions? So if you take a little piece of net and pull it from any direction, you'll notice that it will stretch, it'll adjust a little, and then it'll come tight and support from two directions in a kind of a, a sheet-like uh, configuration. So we find this kind of reticular kidney and locations like the liver, the kidney, spleen, lymph nodes, and bone marrow. And the idea is it's kind of a supporting framework that allows for, you could, can you kind of see how these living cells are distributed around and uh, adhering to this reticular fiber network. Now that means that there is room to move material like liquid through this uh, for the cells to operate on. Uh, it's possible that uh, this organ can move, maybe compress a little or stretch a little. But uh, in general, it's going to uh, basically hold the, something like the liver together into a recognizable uh, appearance and shape. And reticular tissue is very good for that, supporting framework. In fact, that's what fibers are for. Here's elastic tissue. Elastic tissue is important in areas that may need to move, but where you can't put muscles to move them back and forth. So when you bend your spine and these two vertebrae move with relation to one another, you might stretch these elastic fibers out. But when you straighten back out, they rebound, they pull back together. So what are we really seeing here? These small dark spots are the nuclei of the fibroblasts. Those nuclei are scattered out, as you can see in between them, this very, very dense assemblage 
of non-living matrix, elastic fibers. You can see this over here as well, the nuclei in scattered array with the fibers being manufactured and maintained between the living cells. Cartilage. Cartilage is kind of a funny thing. It's amorphous in its appearance. It doesn't have a lot of form, no stripes, no spots. Very few structures. It is made by a cell called a chondrocyte, a cartilage cell that lives inside a chamber. Now, a general term for this chamber is lacuna. We're going to run into that again and again. And what happens basically as we're growing cartilage is that this cell will divide. And this cell is also manufacturing new cartilage material that is deposited outside the lacuna in kind of a circular or global fashion. When the cell divides, you can see the two daughter cells. Now both cells begin making cartilage. And in time, the cartilage that's made between them pushes them apart, separating them. So in, in a short time, there will be a band of cartilage between these cells as the slow synthesis of cartilage continues in a very steady uh, way. Cartilage is a non-vascular material, and it's also uh, ranges in composition from very, very flimsy, very thin, uh, what we would call flaccid or limp, all the way to materials like our nose, our ears, that can actually maintain recognizable shapes because of their uh, firmness. Appositional growth is shown here dividing stem cells and fibroblasts up here, and the chondroblasts forming, uh, basically entering their lacuna and depositing new cartilage as they do so. Now, this is how we grow our cartilage uh, as we are increasing our body size from newborn to adult. And that process is slow enough, growth is slow enough that these cells can keep up with it. But you'll notice this is not a vascular tissue. There's nothing bringing supplies in. It all has to go to these living cells through uh, diffusion. So cartilage is also fragile in one way. If you wear away the cartilage in a certain location, you typically take out all the gel-like matrix and the living cells that are there as well. So that means if that's completely gone, you have contact between the organs that that cartilage is growing between or upon. Good example, a knee joint or a hip joint. If you wear away the cartilage in a hip joint so that bone is on bone, you not only get pain and a, a joint that doesn't work as well, that cartilage functionally will not grow back. So this is why joint replacement uh, is such a wonder. The number one patient satisfaction surgery, it's considered a major surgery, uh, in recent years has been hip replacement. And uh, the replacement is the only option uh, if you've worn away the cartilage. Bone. Bone is recognizable. You know, one of the things that we've kind of seen, I didn't mention, is that living bodies, living cells are good at making tubes. We've seen tubes called fibers, called cilia. We've seen tubes called villi. We're going to see at a different level organs called blood vessels, nerves, which are essentially um, uh, tubular cells. Uh, we're going to see that muscles later are constructed out of tubes called myofibril. The same thing applies here with bone. What we're looking at is the cut surface of bone here. This circle, which kind of looks like a cut across a little uh, a stem or a tree trunk with its rings, is a hard matrix of crystalline uh, deposits called hydroxyapatite. And what we're seeing here is a structure called the osteon. This circle is a tube. If you turned it and looked at it 90 degrees, it would be like a pencil. You can see the edge here running up and down the structure of the solid bone. Now, what we're seeing 
these black spots are filled with bone dust. Those are the lacuna, where the cells of the, uh, the osteocytes live. So you can see how scattered out the living cells are. They are connected, or this structure, this pencil-like tube, is perforated by a central canal. You can see the blood vessels running up and down the center of these two osteons, providing the blood supply, the oxygen, nutrients, and carrying away the waste that keeps those cells healthy. And out here in the periphery, these connected lacuna. The lacuna have a central kind of uh, chamber for the cell with its nucleus, and then these radiating openings called canaliculi that penetrate from one lacuna to another, and cytoplasmic processes connect these adjacent cells. So this cell population on the top here, maybe 20 cells, is managing all of this bony matrix that is between. A great example of our hardest and strongest connective tissue. It gives the body its size. It defines its shape. And through the joints, it defines what movements or articulations are possible. Membranes are a part of connective tissue, and their job is complex. They need to anchor. They need to hold in, into a position. But it's in a body where movement is occurring. So they need to basically uh, provide for some flexibility means stretching, cushioning, uh, to protect the, uh, the materials that they enclose, sometimes to provide a, a low friction surface so they can slide if there's organ movement. Think about being near to the heart. The heart's sitting there filling and contracting, ejecting blood 60 to 70 times a minute. That's a lot of movement. Cell on cell would wear away a lot of cells, but a slick membrane that makes mucus is going to slide. These secretions, like mucus, are another feature of the membranes uh, that protect our organs. The types. If the passageway opens to the outside of the body, either as an entrance or an exit, it is covered with a mucous membrane. Now, here's the, you can see this. Let's apply our formula. Simple, stratified, I'm sorry, simple columnar epithelium. In this case, with either villi, these might be cilia because of the presence of this goblet cell. Here is the mucus held, which is going to be secreted up here and cover the inner lining of this space. The cilia then would be able to move it. These are especially present mucous membranes in the membranes that out, open to the outside, digestive tracts, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts all have an ample supply of mucus uh, of membranes. Now here, a main part is uh, uh, secretion for lubrication, for transport and movement along these surfaces. Serous membranes often have squamous epithelium. See them on top of the areolar tissue. Um, they line the ventral cavities with a double membrane. The peritoneal membrane surrounds the abdomen and digestive tract largely. The pleural membrane is the membrane around the lungs. And the pericardial is the membrane around the heart. Each organ, and sometimes a cavity and organ system, is wrapped in its own serous membrane. The cutaneous membrane is the skin, covers the outer surface of the body, and it's the first organ system we're going to deal with. Often has this kind of hill and valley profile when we look at a slide. Cell division is occurring down there at the base, and uh, cells are migrating up or being pushed up from below, flattening. They actually die. They're waterproofed, and they form this uh, squamous, stratified uh, epithelium that provides our waterproof outer protective layer. The most numerous membrane in the body, though, is the synovial membrane. The most numerous cavity is the synovial cavity. It is a cavity that includes every movable joint. 
and this capsule holds a fluid that adds hydraulics to the support and the lubrication, the free movement, frictionless movement of this movable joint. This is a very, very tough joint because when you come down with your weight, think about the weight coming down on the knee. It's going to press on this liquid synovial fluid. And basically, the pressure in this fluid is going to shoot up all around the inside of this capsule, 360 degrees around the joint. That means instead of just the joining surfaces of the bone, which you can see here, that blue is an articular cartilage, a hyaline cartilage, which will cushion and lubricate somewhat. But we also know that cartilage wears out. The synovial fluid is there and that hydraulic pressure distributes the force all around the capsule and lessens the force on the uh, cartilage and uh, basically lessens the wear of the joint. The fascia showing the connective tissue framework of the body. Here's an example from the lateral right wall of the uh, abdomen, high up outside the ribs. Here's the skin, the integumentary system with its areolar and fat layers. Here's a, as you can see, a deep fascia. That deep fascia consists of these layers of connective tissue that provide ready adherence. So for example, the three layers of the epidermis will lay on this areolar tissue. Here is the inter interconnected um, muscular tissue, the muscles between the ribs are shown here. And then as we enter the body chamber, we have the layers of areolar tissue for adherence on both sides. And then this would be the uh, parietal uh, serous membrane, the parietal side of the serous membrane. Muscle. Our third tissue is muscle. And it's a one trick pony. It's trick. Movement. We are well aware of thinking of our muscles and our strength as those things that move our body. So whatever we do in terms of moving our body around and those functions that require muscle movement, like for example, speech, I have to drive the air with my diaphragm, a muscle. I have to use that air pressure and force it through vibrating cords in my larynx. And I control that pitch as well as volume by opening and closing the larynx, muscle. And finally, I articulate that sound with my tongue, but in the same time, I'm moving my lips and my teeth for the resonance and the enunciation that I want. All of that is muscle. If it's moving in the human body, this tissue does it. Our blood is propelled by muscular contractions. Our food is moved by muscular contractions. Our urine is pushed to the bladder by muscle contractions. You can't really see movement, but it's the best thing to remember about muscle. And there's only three kinds. So let's just learn to recognize them by sight. First, skeletal muscle. This is our voluntary muscle, meaning that we decide when and how to move our parts. Sometimes this is so learned, so trained, that we don't think about it. So I know that when I lecture, I can talk and gesture and move across, back and forth across the front of the room. Uh, without thinking about that, I'm thinking about the content of the lecture. So although it's voluntary and I can stop it and change it at any time, there is a sort of an automatic feature to the way it operates when you talk about posture and balance. This is a very, very odd kind of cell. We're going to learn that in the muscle system. And it has the appearance of a long, long fiber. Some of these muscle fibers are nine and ten inches long, and they're the closest thing we have to a single cell. Each of the fibers has multiple nuclei, 
and see that this one fiber here, here's a nucleus inside its membrane, here's another one. And they have these uh, perpendicular stripes called striations. This is voluntary muscle, striated muscle, our first muscle type. We have a similar appearance in the cardiac muscle cell, but you're doing something different. In skeletal muscle, you're pulling against a lever. So the biceps brachii attaches here at the shoulder and here at the uh, radius and shortens between them. It flexes the elbow, flexes the elbow. A long fiber is perfect for that skeletal muscle. And what's happening between the fibers is less important. But here, the heart's a bag, and what you're trying to do is pump blood. You squeeze down. If there's any uh, permeability through the cells, it would just squirt out. So the cells are shorter. They're branched. So they actually fit together in the heart wall, sort of like yarn in a sweater. They kind of interlace and interlock like this to provide a stronger wall. Um, most of the fluid retention is handled by the endothelium, the epithelial tissue that lines the chambers, but it's supported well by this dense, dense muscle that's below. In addition to being shorter and branched, uh, 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 in fact, often these cells have only a single nucleus. They have these special intercalated discs that show up here. You see these dark lines? where the cells join to one another, and that strengthens the connection to increased surface area, and also actually speeds the conduction of nervous uh, impulses from the pacemaker, so that when we contract our atria, all the cells contract, start that contraction together. The third kind is called smooth muscle. Now, this is the only one that's not striated, and it's spindle-shaped, sort of like an elongated football. It has a point at each end. And these smooth muscle cells are those that line the, um, are found in the walls of our organs. So wherever we're going to move the walls of our organs to propel food or urine or gametes, uh, uh, wherever we're going to uh, move the walls of the uh, lungs or redirect the flow of the blood, it will be smooth muscle cells that do that. This is like the heart, all uh, largely involuntary in its regulation. Some of its effects are predictable, like the heart. Yeah, I can tell you if I run up a flight of stairs, I'm going to breathe harder and my heart's going to speed up. But I don't consciously control that. That's a response. And the same thing happens with smooth muscle. When I'm sitting here like this, it's been a long time since I've eaten anything, my digestive tract is basically at rest. But when I go home tonight and I take my uh, first bite of food and food starts arriving in my stomach, smooth muscles take over with a kind of a contraction, a massage that provides mixing, breaks apart those fragments of food, exposing much more surface area to the digestive chemicals and acid that are there to treat the food as it moves along. Then moving that food through the digestive tract, all the way through the intestines and into the rectum, being held for elimination of his smooth muscle. So one trick pony movement, only three kinds. Finally, we have nervous tissue and nervous tissue is really quite a complex tissue and one that allows us to live in real time, real space. The speed of the signal is critical to something like eyesight, to something like hearing. When I say something to you and you ask me a question and I reply, it is our hearing apparatus that is interpreting that sound or carrying it to the brain for its uh, its uh, auditory interpretation. But if the connecting nerve fibers between our ear apparatus and our brain uh, cortex were not signaling fast, then uh, the speed of the signal would be determined would be uh, would determine how fast I can answer you. Another way of saying that and think about dodgeball. We can play dodgeball because we have a nervous system. You know, you can play dodgeball 
with a tree. But you'll win every time. No matter how many times you throw the ball at the tree, it won't move because it doesn't have that speed of response. So the idea with nervous tissue, fast signaling for communications. Now that's going to be both sensing the external environment, reporting what's outside, reporting what's going on in your digestive tract, what's going on in the chemistry of your blood, what's the liver doing. Those are signals coming into the central nervous system. And then once the central nervous system interprets those signals, messages go out to effectors like muscle. Is it time to move? Either an organ or the whole body? Or a gland, is it time to secrete? Or finally fat, is it time to convert fat to energy? Or are we going to leave it in storage? Those are the three effectors. Muscles, glands, and fat. Uh, the nervous system takes care of all of that quick system, uh, that uh, quick signaling, and it is almost in instantaneous because it's an electric impulse moving through a living cell. It's acting just like a wire. Now, because of this structure that you see here, by the way, this is the characteristic of the signaling cell called the neuron. So it is networks of neurons that actually send the signal. Up here, neuroglia are other cells of the nervous system that are supporting the neurons in their signaling. So it is neuroglia that are going to hold the physical structure of neuronal tissue. And that's going to be hard to do because you don't hook them together with tight junctions. What you do is produce a synapse, a junction that is actually a space. And so, you know, it's a lot harder to maintain that position when it's a space. I'll show you how the neuroglia do it in just a second uh, than if it were solidly membrane to membrane in connection. The neuroglia are going to repair if there's an injury. They perform phagocytosis to clean up the nervous system because a lot of the nervous system is behind a barrier. The nervous system regulates its own contents. It's going to provide nutrients to the neurons it's also going to regulate the composition of the interstitial fluid. So we're going to find the nervous system based on the functioning of this neuron to be very special in its chemistry. Now, the characteristic you look for in a slide and will hardly ever see is this highly branched cell body. Now, these are called dendrites. So these are called dendritic cells. They have these tubes or spines that stick out on all sides. Perform, but producing something that for all intents and purposes looks like a root system. It basically will surround the cell, not just in profile like you see it here, but if it were completely done in a three-dimensional model, you would see it in front of the screen and behind the screen forming a kind of a bush-like network of these very fine endings of the dendrites. These are then connected to other neurons. You can see the telodendria of other neurons approaching and appearing to lay on the membrane of this cell body. But in fact, that's an illusion. It is a small but complete space that is uh, maintained between this telodendrion and this cell body. So this is the kind of linkage we have. After the cell body, we have this long axon, which is basically a connecting wire which branches again down here into telodendria and form connections with the next cell in line. Now, the reason I say it is something you'll rarely see a good slide of is because it, it, it basically spreads out over so much of a volume in the slide that you can't get the depth of field to focus. Well, this is the cell body of a neuron. You can kind of see a dendrite base, a dendrite base, a dendrite base, kind of it looks kind of cornered and spiny, but because these are not lying in the same plane, you do not see them uh, in clear focus. Around them are the neuroglia, fixing them and holding them in position. This one is labeled the axon. They probably had another observation that uh, made, made it clear to them that that single one was the axon. So let's take a look at nervous tissue. The, the characteristic is high branching, 
multiple connections. So, you know, have you ever wondered, how is it we learn? We learn, uh, our knowledge is actually networks of neurons and signals traveling through them. Those networks of neurons are connected by these hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of connections. That space, which is called the synapse, is something that is formed by this growing cell on a daily basis. So we have neurons in contact with other neurons and the way the impulses move across our brain becomes our memory. It is the growing of neurons that allows something we're ignorant of to become a fact that we know and establish it as a part of our memory. If we stop refreshing our memory with a reminder of that fact, then these neuronal connections, these synapses, will be grown over. It's not that they just detach, but they will be grown over by new connections that create new memories. And so a, uh, a long-term memory can become uh, sporadic in its recall, become a faint memory, and then become, uh, uh, it can disappear. So those are the basic four tissue types. Um, it's just a good place though to talk about the body's ability to repair itself because it's a tissue level phenomenon that allows that. And we're gonna just do a very simple run through of tissue repair. There is a special cell called a mast cell. This mast cell will basically exist happily in the circulatory system and in the spaces in connective tissues as long as there's no injury. But when there's an injury, when there's cell debris, when there's exposure to air, when there's the uh, uh, release of cell contents, the mast cell is going to release damage chemicals in that location. This is These are damage chemicals. Histamine, how many times have you heard histamine and antihistamine? Heparin and prostaglandins, all of these indicate a site of damage. And what these chemicals do is they promote a general response called inflammation. What happens? The histamine and other chemicals dilate the blood vessel and blood flow increases to the damaged region. It also makes the vessels more permeable so that plasma and fluids leave the blood vessels and basically so uh, basically suffuse or fill up the tissue in the damaged area that's why it becomes swollen the increased blood flow is close to the surface so it contributes to the red color that you get around a cut or a bruise or a blister or a scrape the high pressure of the blood in these dilated blood vessels and the swollen tissues start to pull the stretch receptors so it becomes tender to the touch. All of these are signals to your conscious mind, hey, there's damage, look at it and take care of it right now. And that's what pain really is. The first pain is generally sharp, basically says, look at me right now. But if you've ever noticed what happens after that first stab of pain, is that the pain is present, but it actually moderates, the pain goes down and the reminder doesn't go away, but it generally doesn't increase to the point where you're experiencing too much pain to take care of the damage. So what happens with these uh, uh, damage chemical responses? With increased blood flow, the temperature goes up. Now the temperature uh, is sort of like a local fever around the, uh, around the damage. That means that um, uh, the increased temperature activates phagocytes, you can see here, increases phagocytes, our white blood cells, which can move on their own, move faster in that area of warmth. Oxygen and nutrient delivery is increased as is removal of toxin and waste. There's a whole population of cells that are generally lounging around the body, 
that are recruited to this area by the histamine signal. After an initial period, that inflammation starts to go down and the cells lie. Fibroblasts to make fibers, uh, cell division of all the tissues that are local, uh, macrophages to clean up debris, arrive in the inflamed region and institute repair. So chapter four, our summary points. We look at four tissue types, our second good look. We saw epithelial tissue, which is surfaces. It will always face the space. We also learned that there are different numbers of layers and different shapes to the cells and that all glands form from epithelial tissue. Cell junctions are those things that hold cells together. Some cell junctions look like sewing. Some look like rivets. Others, there are protein connections that act like glue, holding the elements of support together. We looked at the gland types, merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine, different ways that cells make secretions and they uh, hold them until release. The neuroglia, I mention again, because nervous tissue is neurons. Those are the signalers. It is the neuroglia that will be the system builders and managers. Cartilage growth was very special, and tissue repair was our final uh, topic. So, I lost my pointer. And I'm ready to end the recording on tissue.